So, is the mic on? Yeah. So, hello, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Mark Oda, and I'm with uh, Daniel Gonzalez Notnagel. And uh, we want to present today um, at, um, a question how can, can you deploy a big data or IoT system onto an OpenStack cloud? Um, basically, if you, let's say, have a, a high level view on it, you, you would consider an IoT application as a state-of-the-art architecture or bleeding edge architecture with the newest uh, uh, um, architecture rules following cloud native approaches and all that. But in particular, if you have a cl much uh, more closer look, you will see that uh, hosting a big data system itself has a lot of um, issues. And um, in, within this talk, we will focus on the storage part and we will have a look how we can deploy a big data system on top of OpenStack. Um, basically, why is SAP um, at all um, concerned? So we are, we are using OpenStack um, as our infrastructure as a service. Um, this is um, our uh, um, main target for, uh, for our data centers. So we are uh, trying to onboard all our uh, um, workloads on top of uh, the OpenStack cloud. One of um, our customers or stakeholders is um, SAP HCP HANA Cloud Platform. And HCP is um, something that you can consider as a platform as a service. So it consists of uh, a lot of microservices um, and also um, uh, a variety of databases and, um, and also big data systems to uh, build for our customers and uh, business analytics suite. So in particular, you can build IoT and big data systems on top of that. So for this talk, we will focus on just pure um, open source uh, software, just that we can have a really close and deep look uh, onto um, the, the technologies and how we can really use them within the cloud. Um, so we will use OpenStack, that's obvious. Um, as a workload, we will use Hadoop just to have a closer look and, uh, and to show how we can, let's say in particular, bring this uh, um, to OpenStack. And for storage, we will have a variety of storages, but one that we have a closer look is also Ceph. Um, so at the beginning, uh, we, we ask ourselves, is big data a cloud native application at all? So um, does it follow the, the principles of, of a cloud native application? So the first question is, what is a cloud native application, right? So um, we, we found a, a good uh, document at the uh, uh, Open, data uh, uh, Open Data Center Alliance, um, which is uh, basically uh, consists of a catalog of things that an application must guarantee that, it's a, that it can be considered as a cloud native application. So we pick here three aspects of uh, such applications to um, assess the, the solutions that we are uh, presenting and um, having a closer look whether this follows the cloud approach or not. Um, so first one was, is uh, uh, scalability, so, which means also quite obvious if, uh, if uh, you have high load, you want to scale up, want to bring new uh, nodes to the cluster, this should be balanced uh, uh, automatically. So this is uh, the scalability. Failure tolerance, um, so sure if something fails, if one of the nodes fails, there should be also um, automatically takeover or uh, uh, balancing of the load. And what is really important for, uh, for us as an infrastructure as a service uh, 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 group, it's really important uh, um, to, have, to have infrastructure independence. So it means we don't want to uh, buy dedicated hardware for a, uh, for a uh, uh, workload. So we don't want to introduce graphic cards in our compute nodes, for instance, just because one application needs it. So th these three uh, uh, measurement criteria we will use to have a closer look on the deployments, um, whether they, th these are fulfilled or not. And um, at the end, uh, we have some conclusion here. Um, basically, what is the big data systems? And I, th I think it makes sense if you want to design a storage that you have at least an idea how 
um, the, the data um, the data flow behaves. So and basically for big data and IoT systems, you have two phases or two different uh, um, way you access the data. The first thing is you're writing data because you have a, uh, uh, you have a network of sensors or you, uh, you have uh, um, yeah, a network of data entities that want to write its data constantly to, to the uh, big data store. Um, so basically from a data profile, this is write operation and it's basically a constant flow of data. There will, won't be that big uh, uh, peaks. It will be a constant flow. So that's one of the data profiles. On the other side, um, you want to do some analytics on top of that. You want to see how the data uh, um, looks like that you stored, right? Um, so basically here the data profile is a bit different. Here we have on demand because basically somebody pushes a button and wants to see the result. So we have, uh, it's not a constant flow, it's some, somebody wants to have in real time an answer um, and, and, um, and a, 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 maybe a graph. Um, and it's mainly read operations that you have. So, and from let's say architecture uh, view, this kind of analytics application can be stateless and these can be microservices um, uh, here. But uh, I think the, the, the main issue uh, in hosting a big data system is the, the data storage, right? So how do you put, where do you put this data storage in the cloud? Um, yeah, just no, uh, to, to notice uh, within this data analytics phase, you also have to write back some results, but they, these let's say, are really uh, the, uh, uh, it's not the, the, the major of the, uh, of the work that, that will be done in this phase. It's just, it's just yeah, having some uh, write backs here. Um, so we wanted to also have a closer look to, to HDFS and Hadoop. So I, I quite, uh, I think that the concept is already quite known. So basically you, you have clients, it can be your MapReduce job, it could be a client. For HDFS, it could be something on top. It could be a sensor that it's writing data. Basically, the client always asks the name node where to retrieve or where to put the data. So for read, it will be, uh, it, there will be a reference to the data node and the client will directly access the data node um, uh, and read the data. For write, there's something special. So if you write something to a data node, it's automatically in the back replicated. It depends, you can uh, change the setting here, but usually you replicate it across uh, um, your data nodes. So and this is something that is also special. So you, you have your big data system and there is already replication ongoing. And your storage most probably also do replication. So this is something where you can see you, you, there could be some, some problems with it. But basically, if you just have a higher look on, on this, on this uh, HDFS, big data, Hadoop thing, you would say, yes, all the three uh, measurement criteria are met. So it's scalable. You can add new data nodes, and it will be re rebalanced automatically. Um, it's failure tolerant, so if one data node fails, the other will take over. That's not the problem. And in theory, it's also infrastructure independent, because it doesn't matter whether you put this on a Dell or HP server um, so you, you can choose your hardware. So basically, you can say, yeah, we are end the, the presentation is uh, ended now because we all fulfilled the criteria. But the thing is, if you ha now have a closer look to the problem, you will see that it's not that easy. So basically, we have now the, the question: How quick can we move this big data system into the cloud? And uh, Daniel will give us uh, more details on that and, and give a de uh, an overview about the deployments that, you, that we can do. Thanks, Mark. So basically, when you want to move such a big data workload and Hadoop cluster into the cloud, you have several possibilities on how to deploy this. And the first possibility we want to have a look at is uh, bare metal deployment using Ironic. So of course, um, such a solution most closely uh, resembles a classic Hadoop cluster where you just deploy your stuff on, on bare metal servers. Um, you have the advantage when using something like this that um, you have the direct access to the hardware, to the disks, etc. So you basically have the same performance as with a classic cluster. But there are also some things that you have to keep in mind. So for example, if you want to access the cluster from clients living in VMs, um, so for example, if you want to schedule your MapReduce jobs in VMs outside of the spare metal cluster, um, 
those VMs usually live in a neutral network, so they don't have direct access um, over the layer two. So you basically need some kind of routing between it, and this may become a bottleneck. Also, and this is probably the, the bigger thing here, um, if you want to give each of your tenant their own Hadoop cluster, you're basically back in a pre-cloud world where every tenant has their own hardware, and if they want to scale, they have to buy new hardware, etc. So deploying um, HDFS or Hadoop cluster in the cloud on bare metal usually only makes sense in a, a multi-tenant way, where all your tenants share um, the same HDFS. Um, but if you do something like this, all your tenants will share the same physical resources, and that might be a problem for your security, because everybody can access basically the stuff from, from other tenants. So if you look at the solution with our three criteria for cloud-native applications, we basically see this, that this solution does not really scale, because in order to add new data nodes to the cluster, we have to add new hardware. And when we are in the cloud, we don't want to add new hardware just to scale. We want to boot up a few VMs or so. So we cannot really consider this as a scalable solution. But we are still uh, fault tolerant or failure tolerant because the HFS block, block replication um, works here. So if a node dies, um, the, the other replicas will take over. So you don't have a problem here. Of course, since we are using bare metal nodes here, we are not really infrastructure independent because we have a direct requirement on our hardware. So now for the, for the next type of deployment, we want to tackle the problem of scalability. And obviously, um, to get scalable here, it makes sense to move the data nodes into VMs. Um, and for the storage here, the first solution that comes into mind is um, just using ephemeral storage which um, is provided with each Nova instance. Um, but using ephemeral storage as a backend here for HDFS also has this problem because um, usually um, with ephemeral storage you just have some kind of capacity and the Nova scheduler cuts, just cuts out some capacity from here for your node. So for example, if you use the, the standard file system backend, you, every VM will just create a file in the file system of the host um, and use this as storage. Um, with the LVM driver, for example, um, you have a bit more flexibility since you have more disks under the, the hood here, um, but still you have the problem that all your data nodes are accessing the same physical resources here on the host. So um, if we have many of these data nodes, this might um, impact your performance when all data nodes compete for the same physical resources here. Um, also, because of this, um, it might make sense to schedule your Hadoop nodes independently from your normal workloads, so that your normal workloads are not um, um, affected by the, by the performance of, of these big data nodes. So it makes sense to create a dedicated availability zone just for your Hadoop nodes, um, so that they can be separated from your normal workloads. Also, another problem is that um, usually you have the HFS replication to ensure that you lose no data when a node goes down. But now, since we are scheduling multiple data nodes on the same physical hardware, it might happen that a physical host dies and takes down a whole replica set with him. And that would mean that we lose our data. But luckily, the Nova Scheduler um, provides a feature here called anti-affinity. So you can create a server group in Nova and um, configure it to use this anti-affinity feature, and then Nova will ensure that your VMs are spread over all your um, compute nodes. So um, as long as it has three nodes, it will schedule your VMs there and not on the same, same compute node. So you can minimize the risk here to lose data when a compute node dies. And just to show you that, um, this is really easy to achieve. Um, we printed the, the Nova boot command here. You need to, um, to boot a VM in a, in a um, server group. So you just pass the, the group hint here to the Nova scheduler um, and tell them the availability zone. And you basically get uh, a data node VM that is booted with anti-affinity activated and in its own availability zone. So 
Um, if we look at this more closely here, we see that we have gained scalability now. Since, um, yeah, to, to add more data nodes, we just can boot up new VMs. We are still failure tolerant, but we have to keep in mind to use the anti-affinity feature. Um, but since we are still bundling our storage with the compute nodes, we can still not say that we are infrastructure independent here. Um, because we have, have clear requirements here in our infrastructure, all of our compute nodes basically also have to provide the storage needed to run our data nodes. But before we tackle the problem of the infrastructure independent, we want to show you another solution um, which tackles the problem of the, the performance because of using the same physical resources on the host. So instead of using the ephemeral storage of VMs, um, you can use Cinder here. Cinder has a so-called block device driver which allows you um, to use raw block devices as volumes. So this allows us to pass local disks directly into the data nodes. Um, this, of course, has one limitation. We have to ensure that Cinder schedules its volumes on the same host as the data node runs on. Because since we're using raw block devices here, we can just pass them over the network or so. So we have to make sure that this happens. Um, but um, luckily, the Cinder scheduler also provides a, a filter here, which lets you give him a, a Nova instance ID, and Cinder will ensure that it boots the volume on the same host. So it's also a problem that's already been solved. Um, but you have to keep in mind here, we have now a better scheduling. Uh, we have, can ensure here that the VMs won't com uh, compete for the physical storage. Um, but we still have the problem with the replication, so we still have to use anti-affinity here. And again, we printed the commands here needed to, um, um, to create those volumes with Cinder um, yeah, and, the, and the VM beforehand, um, and how to pass the, the local to instance hint here to the, the Cinder scheduler to ensure that the Cinder volume is created on the same physical host. So, uh, three cloud native criteria here basically look the same as with ephemeral storage. But we have to keep in mind here that we now have a, a better scheduler um, for our storage, which allows us to, to schedule the, the storage behind it better so that our VMs won't compete for, for the same disk, basically. But still, we have to bundle all of our our storage with the compute VMs, uh, compute nodes. So we are still not infrastructure independent with the solution. So how do we gain this now? So basically, as I basically just said, um, the solution is to decouple storage and compute resources here. So by doing this, we um, achieve to make the data nodes completely independent from the storage backend. Um, there is just one thing you have to keep in mind when using a proper storage cluster within there here, because most storage solutions provide some kind of replication. Mark already said it. Um, you have to take care that you configure replication in HDFS and the storage backend accordingly. So if you have replication on in HDFS and also in the storage backend, you will replicate your replications and um, this will um, severely um, interfere with your performance when writing data because you write, you have to wait until HDFS has replicated all its data, and then you have to wait until the storage cluster has replicated, so um, this is not optimal. But basically, if you, um, if you keep this in mind, um, we have a solution here in theory which is um, scalable because we have VMs, which we can just um, boot up and down as we need. Um, we are failure tolerance because of the replication, either in HDFS or in the storage backend. And we are now infrastructure independent since we have decoupled the, the storage and the compute resources we need. But of course, this is just a theoretical model here. Um, to look into a concrete example for such a storage solution, I will now hand back to Mark and um, he will talk about Ceph a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah, so basically it's, it's the very same. It, it, it looks really uh, uh, nice on, on the surface and if you now um, having a more detailed look, we will, we will uh, uh, face issues. So as uh, uh, Daniel already mentioned, so one issue is the, uh, the replication. Um, so 
one easy uh, uh, solution would be we just switch in Ceph the replication level to one. Then we have three times in, in the, maybe in the data nodes and just one time in Ceph. But this will uh, cause the issue that um, you're, you have basically um, a much bigger uh, failure domain because um, it's completely not replicated. So if one disk fails, it, it means that you could have a data loss. Um, so um, basically, um, this is something that, that that you have to consider, which is the right set of replication level in, in both systems. Um, in general, if you use Ceph, it's just a Cinder driver, so Ceph RBD. Um, then it's the very same for operations, so it's just creating new uh, Cinder volumes. Um, so one other thing is also um, a functionality that I want to, to, to highlight here is uh, quality of service. So in Cinder, there's uh, the possibility to, um, to create uh, quality of service rules or rate limits. It's just uh, basically limits the maximum uh, um, data rate. Um, and there's two ways um, uh, that these, these rules can be applied. One is just for uh, libvirt, so it's uh, called front end. So it's the limit in, within the, uh, uh, w um, as a libvirt hint to be, uh, or iotune, um, I think it's the, it's the parameter. So here it, the virtual machine by itself is limited to, to not write that much data. Um, there's also the possibility for Cinder to have um, back-end uh, um, uh, uh, quality of service rules, but this is not supported by Ceph, but by other uh, Cinder uh, drivers. Um, so one, let's say, issue is what happens, let's say, we could also switch the replication down, but what if um, in Cinder you don't, or if you create a volume in Cinder and this will create uh, in, uh, in Ceph um, um, a volume, uh, you don't have control where um, this volume is, uh, uh, is created, so it can be that all the data nodes accessing the very same um, OSD, which may, might be also the same hard disk. So um, basically, if yeah, if you have a hard disk and you you have to wait until the head has to, uh, if the head has to jump, it will really uh, uh, slow down your whole system. So basically, this is a uh, a bottleneck situation, um, and this needs uh, to be avoided um, uh, for sure. So one solution for for that is um, grouping um, the uh, the OSDs in Ceph. Um, so maybe I just have to also give some details what an OSD is, right? So um, basically in Ceph you have two services, a Ceph monitor that monitors the overall cluster and you have um, um, storage daemons. Um, you, this, this, the storage daemons needs to have a uh, connectivity to a device. It can be uh, a bunch of disks, it can be just one disk. Maybe to make it easier, just consider it as one OSD is one disk maybe. Um, and uh, basically, um, on top of that, uh, Ceph has the possibility to um, create um, so-called crush maps to logically group uh, uh, the storage and uh, to a bit control where the storage is located. So what is, what is possible with uh, Ceph here is um, to, grow, um, to create three pools um, and you just um, add parts of the OSD of the OSDs in your systems. So with that, you, you really can avoid this kind of, um, uh, th this kind of uh, uh, bottleneck situation where all the data nodes accessing maybe the very same disk because you completely uh, group them away. Um, so within this example, the idea would be that you have three pools and you have three data nodes, but it can be that you scale your data nodes up um, and then you just, you, you would need more uh, pools and this is not, let's say, fully automated in OpenStack. So this is also, let's say, um, a problem that, uh, that is uh, not solved or uh, not that easy. What, what you can do is if you know, let's say, the average of the data nodes um, uh, that you have, you can, let's say, at least build that many pools that you need. But in general, you don't have, let's say, an automatic way to provision these kind of pools. 
Um, the idea here also is, let's say, to have a default pool where, let's say, the default workload of, of, uh, uh, of Cinder is based, so with all the OSDs. So you have concurrency, but not the current currency on your deployed uh, HDFS uh, uh, deployment. One um, other thing that I would like to, ha uh, um, that I would like to uh, highlight is um, performance. For sure, that's uh, really important. So if you have a Ceph cluster that consists of real hard, drive, uh, hard drives, then it's uh, maybe a good idea to have a closer look to cache tiering. So, um, so if you add some, a bunch of SSDs, um, you, you could use them as a so-called cache. And um, so basically the data will be cached before writing and then it will uh, go to the slower uh, um, hard drives and write the data. Um, the setup is uh, uh, complex and uh, we are uh, about to test that, but we we're, we're not have, let's say, uh, uh, a working end-to-end -end solution here. So it's just, let's say, something that you have to keep in mind if you're uh, facing some issues with performance. Um, here for Cinder, it's also worth to mention um, um, w w if you uh, create more than one pool, it's it's just, uh, it's for Cinder a backend, so it means you need to use the Cinder uh, filter different backend filter. So with that, it's the very same on the Nova side. You can control that the this uh, this uh, HGFS node uh, does not use the very same pool as the others before. Um, so it's the same context in, in Nova. Um, so uh, basically, with this, um, yeah, we can we can say yeah, we're uh, we're now achieved our goal, right? Um, but I think it's obvious that the whole system is really, really also much more complex than the others. So local disk is much easier uh, um, and ha does not have that many levels. Um, basically, we we can say there is uh, scalability is is uh, available, but the thing is that you. Um, that you need to create these this pools in front, so it's it's not really 100%. Um, yeah, the system is failure tolerant as the others before, and you achieve the infrastructure independence by using the let's say default uh, uh, storage that you have in the cloud. So um, Daniel will now show you um, the conclusion, just a summary, and then we will also have a closer look to Sahara because Sahara is, let's say, uh, the tool of choice if you want to deploy uh, an, uh, an Hadoop cluster. And we will we'll see that all the things that we presented here is also possible to deploy with, with Sahara. Okay, so um, in summary, these are the, the different deployments that we have just shown to you. Um, as you see, with bare metal, uh, we have the problem of scalability. As we mentioned, um, you are also not really infrastructure independent here. Um, by moving our workloads into VMs, we achieve the scalability. Um, so this is what you can do with uh, Nova ephemeral disks or Cinder with the block device driver. But what you have to keep in mind between those two solutions is that the block device driver provides us with a better scheduling mechanism so that we can um, um, use different physical drives for, for our data nodes so that they won't contend for the same physical resources. And um, the last solution, the, the Ceph RBD driver for Cinder, um, in our eyes the, the, the best solution, um, fulfills our three criteria. Um, yeah, with a little problem on non scalability that we need those dedicated pools um, to run the solution here. So, um, yeah, as Mark said, let's have a, a short look at Sahara here. Um, Sahara um, uses this concept of node group templates. So you basically define in the template um, how the nodes should be configured in your, in your Hadoop cluster. So we have two examples here. Um, the one on the left is configured um, to use ephemeral storage. So just by configuring it to use zero volumes per node, um, you basically tell Sahara to, to deploy it with ephemeral storage. Um, the example on the right is a little bit more complicated, as you can see. Here we tell Sahara to um, deploy the node with one volume per node, which should have a size of 10 gigabyte. And um, through the volume type, um, we can tell Sahara um, 
which kind of backend we want to use here. So here, for example, we have the, the block 01 um, volume type, um, which maps to, a, to the block device driver in the backend. Um, and you also need to tell Sahara here that it should um, schedule the volume locally to the instance. So that's what we talked about. And when you use the, the block device driver, you must ensure that the volume is scheduled on the same host as your, as your data node. So just by configuring another volume type here, um, which uses the Ceph backend, you could um, also use our, our third solution with Ceph. But of course, you then have to leave out the volume local to instance configuration option here, because that would not really work with Ceph. Um, you don't have to do all this um, through those templates. Um, it is also possible to um, create those, those templates, not in JSON, but in Horizon. Um, so that's basically the, the, the GUI here for this. So as you can see, you can configure everything here, the availability zone for Nova, uh, for Cinder, um, also the, the volume type, etc. So it's basically pretty easy to, to set this all up. Okay, and then just one last slide about what we plan to do now. So um, we want to have a closer look at those different storage deployments, especially on the, on the Cinder block device driver and the, and the Ceph RBD driver. We um, want to measure the performance of them and compare, compare them more closely. And then later on, we want to um, identify any problems with the block device driver um, and enhance that driver, for example, by, by adding better scheduling mechanisms for it. And um, another thing that we want to do in regards to the, the RBD driver is to uh, publish a crush map example. So, um, yeah, and also to publish a, a white paper on this topic. Okay, so that was it. So basically, we're uh, done with the presentation. Um, we're open for questions, if there are any. I think there is a mic. Have you have some? Hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, it's uh, very interesting. Uh, I'm Thierry. I'm from uh, Orange uh, Cloud and uh, CloudWatt. And we're working on big data, so we have the same type of uh, problems mm -hmm. or things we are solving. Um, when, when we are in a big data cluster, um, the quantity, the bandwidth of writing to the disk can be very huge mm -hmm. for each single individual node. Mm -hmm. So somebody may even want to write like uh, one or two gig of bytes per second to the disk per host. Yep. Mm. Um, uh, when you go ephemeral or local disk with Cinder block, then uh, everybody is on its node, right? So doing it on its node, but when you do it through Ceph, then all this goes central somewhere. So how do you figure out the network and entry point to the Ceph storage? Because if you have, like, say, we're a public cloud, so everybody can run its, uh, its cluster, right? So imagine you have 100 nodes or 200 nodes, then yeah. if each of them try to write one uh, gigabyte per second then to the central storage, then, well, I don't know to figure out. Yeah, yeah b basically, um, how can we answer this question? It's, uh, it's basically, um, yeah, you're limited by the network. That's, that's for sure. Because with a local disk, you have your performance of the local disk, and, and, and that's it. Um, and uh, with the network, you, you, what you can do is, yeah, you can you, you spawn a, a dedicated uh, storage network with physical links. But at the end, you will be limited uh, uh, by the network. That's for sure. Um, what I would say is what makes sense is to limit this maximum uh, uh, rate to a, to a limit um, so that you're not completely uh, uh, DDoS your, your Ceph cluster. Um, but yeah, what you said is totally right. That's something that you have to also consider. Um, a local disk has a certain uh, um, um, I.O. rate and, and that's given. And over network, you, you need to have more, more uh, detail look also to the network. Here with this talk, we are really focused on the storage. But yeah, you're, I fully agree to your point. Yeah. Thank you very much. So what, what type of uh, bandwidth have you put towards the safe storage? 
um, yeah, we are we are cu currently in um, in building up, let's say, a benchmarking facility where we try to find this out. So we are not in a phase where we can say, um, yeah, this is the right limit. So that's that's the things that we want to publish next uh, to have more detail. What is, let's say, our assumption here? Okay. So thank you. Yeah, have a nice evening.